from uh, the traditional and unceded lands of the Wasanic <clears throat> peoples. Uh, where we're calling you from at Royal Roads is uh, we're situated on the traditional and unceded lands of the uh, Lekwungen speaking people. So the Kasapsum, which is Esquimalt and the Lekwungen Songhees. And also this was a meeting place for Beecher Bay and Souk people. Uh, uh, their ancestors and families uh, got together and gathered on these lands. Uh, we walk with respect and gratitude to be able to be here. Uh, we carry forth the line lineage that they did of gathering together to, uh, you know, appreciate and learn how to love and um, tend these beautiful lands together, cultivate deep roots and rich relationships of reciprocity and increase connectedness between humans and more than humans. Particularly in this program, that is something that we really take to heart. Um, uh, we celebrate education that recognizes we're part of an intelligent, alive, whole earth system and treat knowledge as a living presence. And just to say a little more about how we're treating and learning to love this land, under the direction of a, one of our indigenous ethnobotanist uh, community members, we are creating a farm at Royal Roads. And we started with a very small plot that was very abundant, a thousand pounds of food last year called the Giving Garden, which we donated food to a number of social profit agencies. So we're starting to really uh, remember how to be in relationship with this place. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you Thanks, so Nancy. much. Yes, I always like when you do the land acknowledgement, and I also acknowledge that I'm on the Lagwagan territories, uh, known as the Sanhi and Esquimal ancestors and nations. And you are correct, I think, with the Giving Garden, we are walking the talk, we're doing our small part, slowly but surely. I'm very proud of that project, for sure. And as I let more people in into the room, just making sure everyone is in the good Zoom room. Uh, I love the title and I know that Hillary will talk about it. The title we gave, Your One Wild and Precious Life, doing research. That makes a difference in what we call MIC. So the Master of Arts in Environmental Education and Communication. We love acronyms at Railroads. So we just met Hilary Layton, Dr. Hilary Layton, who is uh, the program head of the program. And I'll let you introduce uh, our speakers, Hilary. I'll just say that my name is Nancy prévost maurice uh, and I'm joining you from Victoria, BC. I'm an education specialist working in student recruitment at Royal Road, and I'll be behind the scene today answering any question you might have. And I see that some people started introducing themselves in the chat, so very good idea if you can say a little bit about yourself, and if you know the traditional lands you're joining us from, please note it in the chat. And I'll pass it to you, Hilary, to introduce our amazing speakers. Well, I'll do this very briefly here. It won't be like little bios because we're going to really get into a beautiful conversation with these ones. But I'm very grateful that three, st two students and one alum has agreed to spend some time with us today to speak a little bit about their experiences in the program. Lynn Cuvay, there you are. Wave please to the camera. <laughs> there you are, my dear, calling from calling in from Calgary. Uh, and Mary Paquette, Mary, where are you situated? Are you Vancouver? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. And Clea. Clea Roddick, you are calling in from? I'm near the Shuswap Lake on the territory of the Shaquemic peoples. Yes, Interior BC. Yes, you are. So these are the ones that we're going to spend some time with today. So thank you, Nancy. I'm not going to say much more because we're going to say much more later. Yeah. So we in a few seconds redundant. perfect yeah. thanks fantastic and the agenda for today so i'll do a brief overview of royal roads um sorry there's never a helicopter around but there's one right now sorry if it's noisy uh, we'll have a great conversation all of us as we discuss right now and we'll review uh, some information about the program. I know that many of you asked me questions before the webinar, so we're here to talk about the MIG program, and I'll review the application process. And we welcome questions throughout the session, so feel free to use the chat again if you have anything. And as we get started, just a few slides to introduce Royal Roads University. Maybe you can use the reaction button to let me know if you came to campus before, 
I know some people like to take vacation on Vancouver Island and visit rail roads. So we're so lucky to work on that land. And during the program, you get the chance as well to come and visit us uh, in Calwood. So just a, a few slides here, a few pictures. Hatley Castle on the top left, which is one of the iconic buildings we have uh, on campus. If you look behind the castle, you can see the Esquimalt Lagoon, the Olympic Mountains from the United States. The Esquimalt Lagoon is a bird migratory sanctuary. So it's always a phenomenal place to go, walk, study, have your lunch break there. On the top right, you have the Japanese garden. We have 565 acres of land at Trail Roads. Uh, we have a lot of gardens, trails, so you can bike, run, walk. We have the given garden that we were just talking about. So it's a really a beautiful place to visit with friends, family, or to go with your cohort uh, when you come on campus. And a good reminder at the bottom right that Royal Roads University, we were created in 1995 with the intention to be for working professionals and to teach online. So this is not something we had to pivot over the last years. It's really something we do for 25 plus years. So in this program, for example, you'll do some online learning and on-campus learning called a blended uh, model. But really the online learning that we do, I'm very proud of it because it's very interactive. Uh, it's very different from other institutions. And I know that our speakers and Hillary will be able to tell you more today. And Changemaker Campus, that's an accreditation we're very proud of. Uh, only a few institutions in Canada and in the United States have that accreditation called Ashoka U. So it's all about innovation, social justice, and entrepreneurship. So if you want to use some time after the session to Google that and have a look, we're very proud of it. And here we can talk a little bit more about our speakers. And I see some people have questions in the chat about prayer world. So please bring the, your question and I'll be there. Okay, well, I think we'll start with Lynn. <laughs> Sorry, Lynn, it's just the way things roll out. But um, I just want to say just a quick overview of each of these folks, uh, why we were why we've come together today. Lynn is bringing the more than human world into unlikely leadership spaces. So I think that's just in itself really compelling. Um, Mary is making a documentary uh, to make a difference. And that's very general, but I'll let Mary fill you in and we might see a clip. Uh, and Clea has finished her program. She's graduated. And uh, so she performed arts informed autoethnography around music and the land. And I really am curious as to what's happened post program for you. So maybe we can stop uh, sharing the slides, Nancy, and maybe we can go over to Lynn now and um, just have a conversation with you, Lynn. I, I, I just would love you to speak a little bit more about your thesis research and like how it applies to your current life and your work, because I think that's what's inspired it. Um, yeah, and what do you kind of hope to accomplish with this? How will it be applied for you? Mm -hmm. What's Nakumi. it about? <laughs> Nakumi, Hillary, thank you. Uh, Nakumi is thank you and Um, I just want to quickly say that I'm joining you from Mokinstis, which is the place where the Bow and Elbow Rivers meet. In English, we call it Calgary in Alberta. So yeah, my research, it's, um, it is bringing the more than human into an unlikely leadership space. I've spent my career surrounded by conversations about the environment, which I'm sure we've all been in. We hear, and even myself, we're all talking about the environment all the time. Um, indigenous knowledge from past and present um, it, it reminds us that the environment speaks to us, the rivers can speak to us, the plants speak to us, all of these more than human beings, um, they, they can tell us things. And so when I first embarked on my research and thinking about the questions, I really wanted to explore that some more in that idea of asking the more than human, bringing them into meaning spaces. Um, bringing them into the meetings and at meeting at the meeting table so that we can have conversations and hear their perspective about um, about what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. it's really a, a, an inclusion conversation and in many ways an ethical one. 
And so oh. that's <laughs> it's wild ethics. You're talking <laughs> what Dave Abram talks about with wild ethics, his awe project. And you know, so the technology for that, Lynn, like mm-hmm. You know, when we say technologies, I mean, we, you and I talked this summer, we're even saying prayer, you know, we'll stretch yes. technology to be all the across uh, ways that we converge together. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just love hearing uh, this because it may seem sort of spectacularly impossible <laughs> to folks who haven't had this kind of tenderizing that we've had in this program, you know, where we're immersed and the kinds of experiences we have together. Because I think most environmental programs kind of focus on the problems per se. And I think that what you're talking about is more about diversity of thought and explicit ways we form connections between ourselves and the the more than human world or the other than human world. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of like working at that edge of like whole human, ecologically intelligent uh, epistemes, you know, and how to do that, how to bring that. Can you say a little bit more how you're designing and what you're thinking or without like letting the cat out of the whole bag? <laughs> I know you're at the proposal stage, but I am, yeah. I am at the proposal stage. I mean, I, I think that deeply listening is something that needs to be incorporated in this type of research. And, um, it's, it's something that, um, maybe needs to be explored from that ancestral technology mm-hmm. aspect um, mm-hmm. of listening. Um, I think that when I when I think about my my question and I think about this conversation um, that I'll be having with more than human in my research, um, it really is arguably saying that first of all, we can have this kind of conversation that we are able to hear, that we are able to listen. And I think by asking that kind of question, it's decolonizing in itself, just asking a question that already says mm-hmm. we can, we have this ability. So mm-hmm. I think um, that, yeah, that's sort of how I'm going to go about it, but there'll be a lot of deep listening. Um, arts-based research is, is, passionate part of this program and is encouraged through most of the courses actually we are encouraged to explore arts-based research so I am looking at including that in in my research as well but a a lot of listening and a lot of um, working to to decolonize my my own thinking my own assumptions so that I can listen and hear how the more than human might want to be involved in conversations about them oh as a (laughs) co-researcher You know, I mean, I just feel such relief when I hear this. I know it's not easy and it's not (laughs) going to be an easy approach and it's not something that's just, you know, there's no one answer. It's not a singular way of knowing. But on at this time on our forever altered planet, we are being begged to invite this kind of radical repair, uh, you know, this radical coming together and the development of, you know, critical knowledges and practices that come Mm -hmm. from this kind of experimentation. And I'm just so grateful you're willing to do that. And um, you have the chops for it. (laughs) (laughs) I know you're in proposal stage, so I don't want to put any pressure on, but I (laughs) really thrilled about this. And will you be testing it in your organization or will you be doing a prototype or is it just something you're going to conceive and work on later? How is that coming together for you? Here's the beauty of these kinds of ideas. I realize they're expansive. And so I'm I'm going to be starting off mostly looking at my inner practices and hoping that that's going to inform other practitioners who are environmental communicators or working in the environmental field, um, understanding that that the the what's next will mm-hmm. be there. There's a lot, there's a what's next that's possible in this kind of research. And that would be that it it can expand to have um have models or have mm. um, protocols or things like that that could be explored in future research either by myself or, or by other people so that's something I'm hoping to contribute to academia in by doing this kind of research that the here, here's a seed as Hillary would say and as elders would say here's a seed and and, and it can grow uh, from that point but there, there's a there's definitely a lot of um, possibility in exploring this kind of inner work um, that will inform um, like work practices, for example. 
Well, I also hear scope here. And, you know, again, this, this just, you know, makes my heart sing that you're <laughs> trying to do everything in one whole uh, fell swoop and that you, you've, you, you know, you're starting here with something that's really important and just too important to just brush over and go for something larger. It needs some tending. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Yeah. So good. <laughs> Okay, so um, gosh, I have to watch time. <laughs> so thank you so much, Lynn, and um, over to Mary. So Mary, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your research, please. And um, what, you know, how did you, uh, you know, you did a directed study before you embarked on this um, uh, documentary that you're making. And maybe you could tell us how that helped fill in any gaps in your research and maybe what it um, inspired you to, and um, maybe share a little bit about that. I would just love to hear more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I came into this program with like maybe a bit more of a lean towards environmental communication, really interested in, in investigating um, a lot of ideas about environmental filmmaking. Um, and I really, I'm interested to learn about how we understand our connection to the environment through media. Um, and that there's like so much sensationalism we see in wildlife films these days and dramatization and like this anthropomorphic layer we see on top of all of it. Um, and I'm always really interested in thinking about how that changes our understanding of the realities of nature and the natural world. Um, and so something I think about a lot and I was lucky to be able to investigate this in my directed study was um, when wildlife films are made and films about the environment there's so much going on around what the lens of the camera is pointed at there's always so many other stories beyond what you see through the lens um and uh yeah so i was lucky to do this directed study with philip vanini who is a faculty member in the department of communications at royal roads and he's a filmmaker um and yeah he really connected me with a lot of resources um because i i haven't been to film school but i have all these dreams of making films and videos i haven't been to film school so it's great to be able to connect with him and have me or, and have him um sort of host these conversations with me and talk about film and techniques and um how to build a documentary and so while i was in the middle of this directed study with Philip. We had this whole course planned out that we had built together. I got a job offer <laughs> um, that was unexpected and last minute. And um, I was invited to go to Antarctica um, to join a delegation of youth um, as a photographer and a videographer. And so I had this great opportunity to make a video. I already intended to make some videos with Philip, but I was like, this is on another <laughs> level. And I was like, how am I going to make this work? I called Hillary. I called Philip. I was like, we have to make this happen. Yes. And yeah. thankfully, you were both so supportive and it worked out really well. And I went to Antarctica um, and yeah, it definitely is influencing the trajectory of my research going forward. Um, it was just so great that like because this program is part time and because there's so much flexibility, I was able to go have this experience that like really solidified a lot of the things I was thinking about and is like helping to take me in another direction. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I should show my video now. Maybe yeah. I'll show just a little, just yeah, a little spread of your video now. Yeah, <laughs> like you built us to this point. We're ready. Yes. We'd like to okay. See Let me try and do this. Where is it? Share sound. Okay. Almost there. Um, is it sharing? No. No, not yet. Not one second. Okay, here we go. There you go, Mary, you're sharing the screen. Okay, all right. Is that here looking at something here? Let's see the screen. Can't Wait, see the okay, <laughs> uh, one second. Glaciers, and then knowing that yeah. that's all around you too, it's mesmerizing. It's hard to articulate the feelings, the thoughts. Right now we're at the Montreal airport about to board our flight to Buenos Aires and then down to Ushuaia to board our ship to head to Antarctica. The goals of the delegation are to learn more about why Antarctica is important to Canada. Why should Canadians pay attention? What are the connections between the Arctic and the Antarctic? 
and also understand the Antarctic Treaty and the process Canada is currently working towards becoming a consultative party. We also want to make the bigger connections to ocean conservation and climate change. And then we want to bring it all back home and teach other Canadians on why Antarctica is so important. Ever since we started our delegation, we've been meeting with experts, policy makers, government representatives, and a wide range of scientists and experts in their field. Right now, Canada has a backseat role in the Antarctic Treaty, and it's a very important time now as a country that we're applying for consultative membership in the Antarctic Treaty. I really enjoyed the meeting with the ambassador uh, to Canada and Argentina because I could just see how important this delegation was for Canada's becoming involved in Antarctica. So I feel like it was then that it started feeling real and that I really kind of understood the whole concept of why we were down here. Oh my goodness, the first sight of Antarctica. <laughs> I was like, Oh my goodness, who am I and where am I? You see this iceberg from one angle and it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen and then you move slightly or your zodiac moves slightly and you see it from a whole other vantage point. And again, it's a beautiful piece of art. Je me sens petite. Je me sens dans le fond, dans un environnement qui plus fort que l'humain. It's quand même assez impressionnant à voir. Oh, Mary, that is so fantastic. Oh, yeah. thank you for even just that little snippet. Oh, yeah, my so there's, God. There's a bit more there. I can pop the link in the chat later on if anybody wants to finish watching it. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a very transformative experience in a lot of different ways. Obviously, Antarctica is really beautiful and intense and um, dramatic, but um, having come straight from the program, I had all these thoughts about environmental communication and environmental education while I was in Antarctica. And um, it's just such a complex place because nobody, nobody really owns it, but there's this Antarctic treaty that involves quite a few countries where people make decisions about Antarctica. There's no culture in Antarctica. There are no indigenous people that come from Antarctica. And so it's like so interesting to think about how to establish a culture of care for a kind of place like that that has so many stakeholders and, and not any at the same time. And um, like, how do we think about reciprocity with the land in a place like Antarctica where there are more and more tourists coming every year? Um, and like, maybe I would say a bit of a lack of like an environmental education sort of component on these cruise tourism ships um, that help people really connect to the land. Um, so I had a lot of thoughts and feelings, lots and lots of thoughts and feelings. Um, and I've run into like a little bit of um, an issue with ethics and um, using my footage <laughs> uh, for my research project. So I'm I'm pivoting a little bit, but still um, keeping a lot of um, these threads running through my projects, um, sort of about ocean conservation and how to protect nature that's so close to us and vulnerable. Um, and so I'm I'm going to be working with a, an organization called False Creek Friends here in Vancouver, who are trying to establish a national urban marine park in False Creek, uh, which is a, a, a bit of the ocean that extends right into the heart of the city. And it's very alive, but people perceive it to not be so alive. It's very full of life. There are herons and otters and seals and crabs and, and even sharks living in False Creek. Um, and I find there's lots of similarities in, in the way that False Creek has a lot of stakeholders involved in it, lots of communities. Um, live and play and work in Falls Creek, um, just as in Antarctica, there are so many people involved that have a say in um, what the health of that ecosystem looks like. So I think there's still lots of ways I can weave my thoughts into right. this project. Well, um, I love that your project can also be a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say we need these ways that we can be responsible a response able to the lands uh, that and the waters that we're um, you know, uninvited guests on, really. Um, but, you know, I think this program is in some ways an invitation for students to discover this kind of wonder and awe in, uh, but it through aesthetic ways, you know, that might help transform the conversation 
because at the same time you're being transformed, it's quite obvious and embody more of your true nature of wanting to help and to teach and to bring education, uh, you know, but it's almost like you're, you don't have to find some answer to this. It's like you're living this uh, right now. You're living into this question. It's not like there's going to be a pat answer at the end or one right way of thinking. And I just love that you have the courage and the foresight wisdom to, you know, carry this thread through and make a pivot because sometimes we have to do that in research too. Mm -hmm. Right. So Absolutely. Mary, thank you so much. I mean, I want to see the whole film <laughs> for sure, but I'm, I don't have that much time today, but I'm so glad you could come and share. You're just um, definitely alive with this and um, it's lovely to see you It's just shining here. So thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me. Um, so over to Clea, thank you, over to Clea. Um, and Clea, um, you finished your MA. And um, so, right, the question is always, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your research and how it played out in your life and played out as kind of, a, you know, a bit of a pun. Um, and what might you say to someone who's considering coming to this program now that you've absolutely finished it and you did it through COVID and you've done it as a working person and a mother and you know so what might you say about your research and um what's happened and this program for others thanks Hillary and I just have to say thanks Mary and Lynn both of you have really inspiring research I want to have more conversations with you we'll have to connect later um, I'm really grateful to be here, and as I said, I'm coming from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shuquemic Nation. I'm near the beautiful shores of the Shuswap Lake, abundant farmland, and just at the edge of the inland temperate rainforest, which played a lot into my work. Um, I actually didn't know, I was in the Meek program, and I did not know that I lived near a rainforest until we had terrible forest fires and drought in my first year of the program. And also being COVID, we were the first cohort that had to be fully online um, and do our residency online, which was disappointing, but was very rich, actually, in our learning opportunities in our backyards. So I believe that that actually fundamentally affected the type of research that I chose. And I really did focus on uh, deepening a relationship with the place that I live in, and then have begun to have that ripple out into the rest of my life. And as Hillary said, I'm the mother of three kids and I'm a musician. Um, I used to be a performing singer songwriter and worked in a recording studio in Calgary, moved out here to the middle of nowhere to take a departure from the music industry and went back to school. Um, and then from there, the way things come together, as I was in the Meek program, I was so influenced by the environmental education concepts that I was able to translate that into a new art space that I began to co-found here in Salmon Arm. And it's a concert hall, but a multidisciplinary art space. Um, and I really feel like I was continually influenced by the Meek program the whole time as I've developed and designed that space, which really serves our community in a wide variety of ways. And I see myself as a person that's working in service of socio-cultural and ecological systems and the intersections between them. So within the Meek program, I really learned how to consider the overlay of systems and you know, move myself through my different lives and, and ways of being in the world and actually bring all those different selves together and really feel at home in my place. Um, my research study is called Walking the Deer Path, Resonant Relations with Place. And as Hillary mentioned, I draw from my background as a musician. Um, I didn't actually anticipate how much music was going to come into this pro program, but I did leave it a bit open as an emergent arts-based research project. And I really focused on uh, developing my relationship with my place um, with a lot of understanding that uh, we're in a time of reconciliation with our First Nations peoples, but I didn't want to lean too much on, uh, I'm very um, inspired by the incredible leadership that we have here in the Shuswap from Shuswap Nation, but they were also grieving deeply with the, the news of the 215 children at the time when I was beginning my research. So I, did, I, I really wanted to connect more with my Indigenous community, but I also didn't want to 
burden them with my requests of my personal um, research things, which seemed very small compared to what they were dealing with at the time. So instead, I really looked to Indigenous scholars. Um, I drew, drew from words that I had heard in my community and relationships that I have in my community, but not directly. And instead, I really looked to the more than human world and built up a place-based relationship with my local backyard. And my method that I used is called place bonding, in which I really conducted a study that was um, a, a methodology where you go to the same place on a regular basis. In my case, it was three or four times a week um, over three months of that time. And I just it was a in walking distance of my home because as an environmentalist, wanting to reduce my impact on the earth as well. And also I went into a regenerative burn site because I had learned so much from those forest fire times in 2021. And I just decided that I really lacked relationship with the deeper forest where I lived. So I spent some time there with the same practice. And in that time it was autoethnography. So I was doing a lot of reflective writing and arts making and what I thought was going to become a collection of poetry, and there is a collection of poetry, there also developed many songs and it just turned into this beautiful little project in the end I'm really proud of it because I feel like I have a contribution to give back to the environmental education community and that is in the form of a songbook. It's so a it's song like, book. Yeah, it's a song it's a book that goes with your work here. It's right. amazing. And the first yeah. part of it is up on SoundCloud. I'm gonna share a link there if you're curious. It's really songs um, that came from this place bonding time and a really authentic uh, relationship building time with the more than human world. And I have been already, it's great, it's already going out there to in, in local outdoor education. Um, enthusiasts and teachers have been requesting it and it's amazing how it's like taken legs and it's it's running away uh, <laughs> so. well, you know what I love Clea is that um, you know I worked with you in your undergrad too and um, you know I knew music was important but it's almost as if this time you let something come through you it was almost as if something was coming through you like a transmission from that time that you spent dedicated to sitting uh, you know, with others, <laughs> sitting away from screens. I mean, so much of our work is, you know, um, especially academically, is to read something, reflect on it, and write. Whereas you went out and you actually let something come and then made meaning of that, and even in making songs, and then brought that to bear. You know, I'm often asking the question, um, you know, instead of asking how intelligent are you, which is tied to all the IQ and all those things that really never get to the heart of the matter, I'm interested in how are you intelligent? <laughs> because that means how are you in relationship with the rest of the world, the other intelligences of the world? And I, I just think this is so timely, so beautiful. And I love that your songs have taken on a kind of a flight pattern of their own, because that makes sense to me. Um, you know, your work has to be shared. It's just so beautiful. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah. And yeah, I really do find like in, in terms of what advice um, to, to give to people considering the program, what you're mentioning, uh, that pull and that call and feeling um just like, I, I don't want to say aloud because it's really the, an encouragement and a support that is given through the program to really follow what you feel is your important environmental corner to work in. Because as we know, it's <laughs> there's a lot to do. And it's very overwhelming sometimes when we get bogged down in the weight of everything that needs to be done for this planet. Um, one of the incredible benefits that I received out of this program is just like the network of the cohort and the faculty and to realize there's so many really passionate people out there working in just wonderful work like as you can see today just looking at what Lynn and Mary are doing is really inspiring me and this is a frequent occurrence every zoom class every connection, every time, um, you know, of course, our in-person residencies, you should have seen us celebrate because we'd been online for two years. We <laughs> finally did get to have an in-person residency and our, the, the connection in our cohort was just amazing. We and been we have photographic evidence. <laughs> yeah. 
Clea, I have to just say. We were online for two years. We hadn't even met in person. And it was like we had been together forever. It, like, and and the um, what I'm trying to say is it really reduced my own ecological anxiety yes. that I was having because I could see it's not just me that cares like this. It's well, you know, when I'm you in start to see of caring people and we are all working hard together. When you start to fulfill what our friend Bill Plotkin calls the eco niche, you know, your part of the ecology, when you start to uncover where it is that you're deeply connected, what you love, what you're passionate about, that eco anxiety goes down because you're part of something greater than yourself and you're contributing, you're in service. I think you're talking about service. Yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah. And I do feel that like engaging in the Meek program, like I say, the whole time I was designing an art space with this ecologically minded sensibility that I'm learning in the program, I was able to then consider uh, our arts organization as part of an ecosystem and have always worked in the designing of that business as with the ecosystems approach. And that has done nothing but you know, create a, a place where I collaborate in my community. Like just an example in terms of something I'm doing recently is I live in a small town in BC that never celebrated Earth Day. <laughs> because I don't know why, but there's a lot, there are different um, environmental organizations of all types and they're working away in their own little corners. And I am quite connected with a lot of them. So I've now collaboratively designed an event with the downtown association and the curator of the art gallery who shares my passion for environmental arts messaging in, in communicating environmental messages. So we've brought together an Earth Day event for our town that is about sustainability education and artistic ways of celebrating the earth and so we're gonna yeah have I'm gonna have to say <laughs> I love hearing all about this but if we don't um get to our the rest of our stuff we won't get to it today oh yeah sure you should have yeah. given me the wrap up at it's okay time. I just I love <laughs> no I love talking with you I've had the privilege of being you know in a supervisory capacity and I'd say an accompaniment with you for a few years now from your undergrad till now and I was just so thrilled when you chose this program. I'm so deeply grateful. I learn every time I'm with you. I'm just so happy you're doing what you're doing in the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And boy, I hope people will reach out to any of you three just to talk more about the program if they're curious about, is this for me? And can I make a difference? And what difference does this degree make? So I love how you've articulated all of that today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. And you can hang on and see more about the program if you want. But I think you know the next slides that are coming. So if you have to uh, head out, that's fine too. But thank you so much. Thank you all. And I'll turn it back to Nancy. Thanks, everybody. Thank oh, you've you got so lots much. of love yes. in the chat. Wait a yes. second. Lots so of much love wisdom and inspiration for sure. Yeah. And I'll make sure to share. Uh, the information that you're sharing in the chat with the recording so everybody has access to it. So would you like to talk a little bit with the program structure, Hilary? Sure, sure. About yeah. it. Yeah, I'll Thanks. just change this slide here. Now comes the least uh, interesting part, except I find it interesting. So this is a blended program, which uh, what uh, Cleo was saying, we had to go online during the COVID years, but we pretty much have on-campus residencies to start. We go online to do uh, a chunk of the coursework and we have a second residency uh, just before you go off to do your research. So we have a little bit of everything. That's what Blended is, um, is called. So this program is designed in a way that it starts with three courses. Um, you can sign in for the whole MA, but if you also just want to get started in a small way, you can sign in for the first three courses, which is the graduate certificate, and that's five months long. It's a three-week on-campus residency. Uh, it's one it's one course by distance, and that's a nine-credit certificate, and you'd be with the whole MA cohort, uh, the diploma cohort, and the graduate certificate cohort. Most people who start with the graduate certificate get bitten by the bug and they sign on mid-residency <laughs> to the rest of the program. It's about a 90% conversion rate because they say, hey, these are my people. So yeah, we'll just carry on here, Nance, thanks. Those are the courses. There's um, 500 and 503 are in residency on campus and then 508 is online.
learning theory and design. Yeah. So if you choose just to do the coursework, you can uh, graduate with a graduate diploma in environmental education and communication. Thanks, Nancy. And that's about a year and a bit long. It gives you the first three weeks on campus, the online learning, uh, and then the last uh, residency, which is two more courses on campus, and it comprises 24 credits. The next screen, yeah. So you've got the first three that are the same. Then you go into a systems course, it's a marvelous course. Then you go to your research methods course, uh, you do worldviews and environmental ethics. And then for your second residency, uh, you enjoy the biosphere and sustainability, which is delivered in part as a field school, usually in various um, First Nations, Indigenous communities on the coast. Uh, and then you come back on campus for two weeks and I teach eco-psychology. And that's another full immersion uh, on campus and uh, has a tremendous focus on arts-based inquiry as well, as Clea mentioned. Uh, if you're going to do the full MA, <laughs> okay, yep. So it's the same as everything we've talked about, but it includes a final research, which is either you decide on a thesis, which is 12 credits, or a major research project for nine credits, and you do an elective course. And that elective course is what Mary was talking about. She did a directed study with someone who could fill in her knowledge gaps for her. And then now she's on a major research project with that same uh, person. Uh, you. Okay, yep, so we do all, no, that's good. Thanks, Nance, we'll go ahead. Yeah, we do all the same courses, except that once you finish the second residency, you either turn toward working on your thesis with a supervisor and a committee member, which will end up eventually in a defense. You have an external examiner and a defense, or you do the nine credit major research project, which is very applied and just as rigorous, but smaller in scope, and you do an elective program. So usually you do your elective first that fall after the second residency, and then you start on to your MRP in about January. Uh, sorry, I see something from Helena who says, what is the tuition for both programs? Is there an opportunity for part-time studies? <clears throat> well, this is considered full-time study, although you're only doing one course at a time, Helena. So uh, there's only one way to really take this, and, and uh, it is this, uh, this program. And I'm not sure on the tuition. I'd have to defer to admissions uh, on that for you, or send you to the admissions page, or the, the um, maybe Carla could put that yeah. up. Yeah. Thanks. I just see that Carla from Enrollment yeah. Services is with us. So yeah, thank yeah, you. That's we'll great. Thanks, links. Carla. If you could just put the link up, that would be wonderful. Okay, Nance. Okay, that's over to you then, I suppose. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Wow, we're doing a quick quick overview here, but everyone who is in the room, please feel free to, again, ask questions in the chat or stay longer after the presentation. Uh, what we do really well at, at Royal Roads is the admission style. So we have standard and we have flexible admission. So maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not coming from kind of the typical way from like college to university. Uh, and I have some experience and volunteering and work experience. So you will be uh, happy to learn that we have flexible admission. But to start with, kind of the traditional path will be you're coming to Royal Roads with a four year undergrad degree with a minimum GPA of B. We ask for two years of relevant work or volunteer experience or a combo of both. And if you have the degree requirement, but you don't have the GPA of B, then we'll uh, ask you to take one of the course we offer at Royal Roads with professional and continuous studies called academic writing and critical thinking. And this one, we uh, ask you to have a, a final grade of a B, which is about 73%. And I know many people in the standard and flexible admission, if you have been away from school for a little while, this course is very helpful just to get up to speed with APA citation, how to read research, um, how to write for uh, academic purposes. So I highly recommend, I took it a few years ago, really enjoy it. And I'll show you about the flexible admission here too. And again, we can always uh, answer question. You find all that information on the website as well. So if you don't have the standard admission and you have about six years of relevant work experience, 
or again, that combo of education and experience, you're welcome to apply to the program under flexible admission. Mm -hmm. And you will, I will show you in a few seconds, what are the documents you need to submit, but you will be able to demonstrate what you have done in the past, who uh, brings you to the program, who will make you a good candidate to the program. And it's important for me to say that flexible admission, it's not something you check as you apply, that will be the admission advisor reviewing your file that will let you know if you need to submit more documents because you'll be coming under flexible admission. And we say generally uh, required to take that academic writing and critical thinking course. And we ask that course to be taken way in advance of your program. So we'll see the new and uh, the next intake states coming up, but uh, that's always a good thing to do that uh, short course before, and then you have a little break, then you can join. Uh, Mary, that certificate. Oh, sorry. Mary yeah. I'm just going to answer Rachel here. Um, yeah, academic sure. writing and critical thinking is online and it's, um, it's a pretty much standard course that most people who haven't been to school in a while or come in under flexi would want to take. There are yeah. some exceptions, of course, if you, you know, you have, uh, already have that in your toolkit because when you're in the thick of wrestling with really wildly good and wide ranging information, you don't want to be wrestling with your writing skills. You want to be able to have those writing skills and academic writing is very different than any other kind of writing, truly. Mm -hmm. Once you have those skills, then you can really let that go and focus on what's important here, which is content. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And we'll make sure to send you the links to yeah. register for that course as well. And because, then, sorry, yeah. there's another question. I think there's six different intakes during the year. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Yes, the start date. Academic Perfect. Yeah, yeah, someone was asking for the start date. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Carla, for popping the link here. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one just hearing all those fantastic stories. We're like, oh, how do we join? How do we apply? So you will go to railroads.ca to start your application, submit your online application with this fee, the little fee of $131.39. And then you will start submitting your documents. And I'm very pleased to say that we have a new system that just launched a few days ago. And now you'll be able to update all your documents on your own uh, on, under what we call my admin. So don't don't take any notes now. We'll guide you through that. But it's it's kind of a step forward to make it easier for you to apply at railroads. And then you'll be submitting your official transcript. So any post-secondary institution you attended in the past, we want to see your transcript for that. We want a detailed resume. So you'll have to sit and write down your resume, really showing us your work experience, volunteering, uh, education. And same thing a little bit with the personal statement. So it's a good exercise for you to sit and be, okay, where was I before? Where am I now? And where do I want to go in the future? And really reflect on that and write it down so we can get to know you. And that's a fantastic opportunity for you. If you had grades in the past, for example, that didn't go well, uh, some session maybe at past uh, institution, then you can write it down on the statement. Why is that? So we better understand. Nance, also, can I, yes, go can ahead. I yeah. Add something there to uh, the personal statement. Please. So what we really look for is your story. We, we want to know who you are and why you and why now and why this program. So what kind of linkages do you start to see with, you know, even if you don't have an environmental education background or an environmental communication background, if you're in a completely other industry and you want to say, this is what I'm seeing now, this is what I want to do, this is what my passion is, that's critical to that personal statement. And, you know, it's not un unusual also for me to pick up the phone and just call someone and have a conversation about, you know, you, what you're doing and what you're thinking of in your future, because I, I think it's really important that you get clear on some of those bright threads of yourself, because we pull those through the whole program and your research, as Clea showed, as Mary showing, as Lynn showing, is so applied. It's so uh, true to your your own passions, your own life, your own nature, uh, that, you know, it's good to have that right up the front so that you know uh, why you and why now, just to quote the Talmud. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead, Nancy. No, that's perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. And, and again, it just shows people in, in the audience that the, 
we we do things differently because yeah you will pick up the phone and have a conversation that's great like we really want people to succeed and to be in the good program uh, and two letters of reference again all that is mentioned on the website uh, we often see a letter of reference from an academic person and then maybe a professional person it can depend uh, and those letters will be sent directly to railroads by your referees and we have a, a few guidelines on the website to help you with those. And again, what I often recommend to prospect is you can write down your personal statement and then share it with your referees so they will know why you want to apply and then they will be able to write down a letter for you. And I'll just continue with just a few more slides and I'll check the question as well. So key dates, I had a few questions in the chat about it. So you can join the next cohort. There's still room for July 10, 2023. That gives you a few months, one month to apply. So you don't have to wait for April 10. Obviously, you can apply even today, this weekend, start your application and then start submitting your documents. If you want to apply now, but select the 2024 date, this is available as well. So both those intakes are available and there is room. And Nancy, we never turn people away who apply in June. Oh, <laughs> we want nice. you to apply earlier <laughs> for planning. We really hope you can start getting that application process. But, you know, there is no way that we would turn someone away who had it all together, uh, you know, before the program begins. Because if it's meant to be, we know that sometimes mm -hmm. these things are a bit, you know, unwieldy and not necessarily straightforward. But uh, if you feel drawn today and pulled today in any way, shape or form, or see yourself as part of this program, then don't let anything hold you back. And, um, you know, even that deadline. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And and as a prospect here and not yet a student at Royal World, you still have access to a few services. So we have financial aid and award. I really encourage you to go on that website, check out what they have to offer. They have internal and external loans and grants, uh, depending the province or the country you're joining from. So they're really the, the, the best people to talk to because we know that going back to school is a youth. There's an impact, there's a youth component that is money. Um, so please feel free to use that resource. And we also have Carla here with us today from Enrollment Services. And you, re you can reach the team at learn.more at railroads.ca. You can give them a call and you can even book a Zoom call with them. So you're one-on-one -on -one discussing the program. And they can even connect you with maybe one of the ladies you heard before or any other students or graduate we have from the program if you have any question. And I think that's a very useful uh, tool that you can use as well to, to ask more questions. Yeah, there's nothing like hearing it from someone who's been through it because it's ambitious to do this while you work. It's not easy, that's for sure. No one will tell you that it was easy. But yeah. what in what in life that is really important to you or really good ever been easy? Most of those things are hard ones. So, uh, and you're not alone. You're in a cohort, so there's tremendous support, which you heard from uh, one of the students today. There's just such a tremendous network, and um, it just brings joy in the midst of some of the challenges. You know, I love seeing this picture. This is a student of ours from oh a number of years ago, but I remember the day she was teaching out. Uh, under that big tree at Royal Roads, and uh, she is she since guides and teaches full time. And uh, I've stayed in touch. I just I just love seeing. I didn't know that that was Eliza. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love it. No, I love seeing these slides. Fantastic. And another one of our wonderful students who works in frog um, conservation. So um, I wanted to end today with um, the reason I named this uh, webinar. Um, what is it you want to do with your one wild and precious life? And some of you might know the wonderful poet Mary Oliver and her poem called The Summer Day. And so uh, as it's sunny here today and uh, the daffodils, uh, at least the ones sheltered in the, the, the side garden are showing, bravely showing their yellow beauty. Uh, you know, we're coming into spring here. Uh, and so this, this is our allurement to summer. And here's, here's this poem. <clears throat> who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the
the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I, I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, and how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver. <laughs> what a beautiful way to end the session. Thank you so much, Hilary. Thank you, Thank everyone, you, for Nancy. being active in the chat. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear from anybody. Um, you can also pop, Carla, if you want to, maybe I'll just pop my email in here too for anybody who wants to talk to me about this program. I'm happy to have a conversation either on Zoom or phone or um, by email and um, not to worry, Tanil, we'll send you the, the link. We'll send you a, um, a recording of it. So not to yes. worry. And thanks everybody. I can see people came from all over and um, any questions, if you wonder this is, if this is for you, let's have a conversation. Might be able to help you with that. So everyone, thank you so much. And thank you,